Well, a very, very warm welcome to what promises to be a very special um, event tonight. My name is Monica Bomduch, and as some of you may know, I was the initiator and I'm now the creative director of a big cultural project called Insiders Outsiders, which in the first instance was designed um, to pay tribute to the hugely rich contribution made by refugees from Nazi dominated Europe to this country's culture. It existed as a real life festival for a year across the country. It was rather wonderful, I have to say. But come COVID, I was prompted to go online. And this event forms part of a very rich program, though I say it myself, of online events that started last June and is really set to continue. Anyway, let me cut to the chase. Um, Yes, as I say, the first intention was to pay tribute to the original generation, those who actually came, who were so profoundly displaced uh, by the Third Reich. Um, but as a kind of natural sequel to that, I'm increasingly intent on giving a voice, as it were, to the so-called second generation. Many of you will know exactly what that means, but it's to people like myself, the children of refugees who found sanctuary in this country. And of course, that's very much where Ros Grimshaw comes into the picture. And, um, you know, I wanted very much, I mean, well, part of what I am doing, what I have been doing over this time is to kind of also give exposure to lesser known figures. And I will be completely honest and to say that until Angela got, Angela Baum got in touch with me, I hadn't come across Rosalind Grimshaw and what a, you know, loss on my, well, you know, what a, what a gap in my knowledge that was. I mean, she's a wonderful artist, as many of you will know, and sadly she is no longer with us. And I'm very, very delighted that we're giving a chance for perhaps a larger number of people to, to bear witness to her achievements. So without further ado, let me introduce first Patrick, Patrick Costello, and then Angela Baum, um, who will be our main speaker today. Um, we'll keep it very concise. I'm reading to you what they sent to me. They could, I'm sure, say much more about themselves. But anyway, Patrick Costello is a stained glass restorer and craftsman with 40 years, long time, 40 years experience in the, in, in the field. Um, in the 30 years he lived in Bristol, as many of you will know, he shared a life, work and love with Rosalind Grimshaw and he now is based in, in Dorset. And the second speaker will be Angela, Angela Baum, who's a Bristol-based um, abstract painter, interested in the unconscious, as she puts it, and painting intuitively using collage, text, and found objects. She shows work regularly at the um, BV Open Studios in Bristol, and most relevantly for today, she was a great friend and, as she puts it, a spiritual sister of Rosalind Grimshaw. I'd just like to add a kind of personal note that I got to know um, Angela way back in the 1990s when I had the great pleasure and honour of including her in a show which um, was a tremendous project. It was called, I mean, it, uh, it was called Rubies and Rebels, Jewish Female Identity and Contemporary British Art, which looking back, Angela, what a mouthful, <laughs> but Rubies and Rebels was the main title. And Angela was one of 20 or so fabulous artists that I had the pleasure of working with. So we, we go back a long way, as, uh, as they say, and I'm, I'm very delighted to be back in touch. Good. So without further ado, um, Jess, who is Angela's um, daughter-in-law, I think is going to be in charge of the PowerPoint display. And Patrick, as I say, is going to be the first speaker, but we want first to give you a chance to hear um, Rosalind's own voice. So over to you, Jess. Is there a problem with the with the sound, Jess? Yeah, I can't. Oh, it was working. No. Ah, oh, we thought we were being so well organised. Well, it's odd, isn't it? Because we did try it. No. Are you muted, Jess? That shouldn't make a difference. Um... Did it. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, maybe we'll come back to it. If it's really not working now, we can try again. All around the whole window are squares because I love little squares in borders, but it really represents a firmament. And I have no idea what a firmament is, so I thought I might as well represent it with squares as anything else. <laughs> lovely. I'm glad. I'm glad that worked. Um, lovely. So I think over, over to you, Patrick. Good evening, everyone. Um, this this talk is 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 an expanded version of the eulogy I gave at Rosalind's funeral on December the eighth, twenty twenty. Very strange that today we've got gorgeous spring day. 
then, it was just before the shortest day. Today, we're just after the vernal equinox, but nevertheless. This comes, it's a lament for an introduction to a dear friend who is a special and unrecognized talent with a relevance to this insider outsider festival. My name is Patrick Costello. Having done a degree in humanities at the Middlesex University, specializing in art history and literature, I left London and moved to Bristol where I took up an apprenticeship in the stained glass at a workshop, Joseph Bell and Son in Bristol. It is here that I first met Rosalind. The significance of this workshop studio is that it has been owned and run by only two families since its founding in the 1840s. The founder, Joseph Bell, had a direct link to the Victorian stained glass Gothic revival. And the next owner, Arnold Robinson, trained with Christopher Wall, who was the seminal influence of the arts and crafts movement. It was then run by the son of Arnold, Geoffrey Robinson, until it was closed down in 1996. Now, Rosalind trained in fine art at Ravensbourne, Hornsey and Brighton Schools of Art. And she then worked at the Little Angel Marionette Theatre and taught art at a school in London's East End. She met John Grimshaw, who she followed to Africa, married and came back to live in Bristol. Back in Bristol, she designed and made her own clothes, which she then sold in her shop with painting and printmaking posters for the Young Vic Theatre. And then she was offered the, the opportunity to rent space and work in stained glass at Joseph Bell and Son. This was in the late 1970s. And so began a 40 year adventure in stained glass. Now in the early decades of the 20th century, as the arts and crafts designers gained momentum, the medium itself was vitalized with developments in glass making. The glass became ever more exotic, with swirls, streaks, flow, flaws, bubbles and striations making the medium itself implicitly interesting enough as to be art. The skill of arts and crafts stained glass artists expressed that were not to be inhibited by the material, but to make it the springboard from it to the starting point of their creativity. Rosalind was working in an environment steeped in the ethos and atmosphere of the arts and crafts movement and which she embraced wholeheartedly. From her first windows, Rosalind pushed glass to its limits. It was there to serve the image she wanted, to be manipulated and worked to serve her vision. Ros would pick out a remarkable piece of glass. Then she'd obscure it with a wash of paint called a mat then brush, stipple, and needle away in the process, drawing out the, the image or the effect that she wanted. In the process, enhancing the beauty of that individual piece of glass. Every piece was worked to the limit and gradually built into the whole of the finished panel. Her work could be described as a process of revelation. This technique of working every piece of glass could be described as the form of her work. And whilst the form of her work could be described as revelatory, her content was a process of addition and layering. A good example is her piece, Rosalind. A little girl dances on a Persian carpet in a garden of creatures. She holds the symbol of theater, a bladder on a stick, it is a commission celebrating the birth of a daughter to a close friend and his partner. And she is an actress celebrated for her work in Shakespeare. No doubt it influenced the artist that her friends named their daughter partly after the Shakespeare character in As You Like It, and of course, the artist. Rosalind liked to put together images, collage-like, to make a story, Again, a process of layering the story through images. Now, pictures of violence made in 1980 at the height of the troubles in Northern Ireland. This window, now in the Ely Stained Glass Museum, she uses this technique and creates an assemblage of images of violence. 
reading from the top left, the legs of the crucified Christ, picked out from a box of bits in Ireland and next to a boy walking past a burning car in a bombed out street in Northern Ireland. A thin band of images of the everyday with a pack of cigarettes and lighter, a newspaper with the headline flagging the, flagging the title, Violence Follows 10th and Signature Geranium. The bottom half of the window has a background of shadowy figures in a room superimposed on images from newspaper cuttings of a gunman and his hostage, a woman and child from the famine in Eritrea. The band at the bottom shows a decorative back of a sofa and a title, pictures of violence created out of glass and lead. This technique of writing the titles cut out in glass shapes and leaded, and lead, and leaded represents the words as colorful images in themselves. This comes to a climax in her creation window where the quotes out of Genesis that acts as a title in the summary of the whole window and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Even the words and titles of her window are expressed in the medium of stained glass and lead. In 1998, Rosalind was invited to exhibit a panel of her own choice at the Deuxième Internationale stained glass exhibition at the Centre International de Vitrail in Chartres. At the first international exhibition, she had shown one of her first panels, Esther and Francis watching telly, which had won a, a Company of Glaziers prize. This invitation brought with it the offer, the offer, sorry, the, the, the invitation for the second international exhibition. It brought with it the offer of free glass to be supplied, supplied by the Saint Just Glass Works at Saint Gabin. For Rosalind, this is sweets for a child. This exhibition invitation coincided with the 50th anniversary of Kristallnacht. And I do remember that there was an air of anxiety around this anniversary. And at the time, Rosalind had conversations with two Jewish friends who were involved in projects provoked by this haunting anniversary. Her lecturer from Bristol University Education Department was finishing a memoir of his experience as an exile and one of the children in the kinder transport. The cover of the book shows his travel papers out of Germany. Feature, and it features as part of a collage of the images relating to Kristallnacht. This drawing is also, it's in the Imperial War Museum. Another close Jewish friend and writer, Hugh Brody, was working on a book, Means of Escape, books of, of short stories, two of which told juries, short stories of his Jewish family in exile. And he used Rosalind's window as the cover of the published book. Now returning to the window, an object associated with Christian sacred culture memorializing the destruction of Jewish people and culture through smashing glass and build it burning buildings represents a cluster of paradoxes. A dream of Kristallnacht. This panel was bought by the Imperial War Museum for a new gallery depicting images from the Second World War. The overall image is of a woman's hat, of a woman's face in a hat and veil against a blue background. The crown of the hat contains a skull, a memento more, and echo of the Nazi's death head. There is a burning moon-like head in the right-hand corner and an angel falling out of the sky. A blue background streaked with flashes and like tears and breaks, prisms, like lightning flashes, Nazi insignia and holes in the sky, a paradoxical play between creativity and destruction that is depicted in the blazing buildings and synagogues across the bottom of the window. The veil of the, veil of the woman's hat is made up of diamond shapes that conventionally make leaded light plain glazing, but here, Rosalind fills them with portraits of her father's German Jewish family in Battenberg. 
the additional title, the additional title, sorry, they thought they were Germans across the bottom, refers to the fact that after generations of the family living in Germany, her grandfather won an iron cross in the First World War, it, which was a common and bewildering and cruel experience for many German Jews in the early 20th century. At the opening of the exhibition, Ros and I stumbled in our best French to reassure the German wife of the director of the musée that offence was not the aim. Looking at the work now, I can see what an upsetting and haunting, if compelling, a memorial it is. In 1996, the studio, Joseph Bell and Son in Park Street, closed down and we built a new workshop at home Six Winter Terrace. This was a timely move as Rosalind found her Parkinson's was wearing her down and the walk to Park Street becoming too much. She could preserve her energy for her work. All this time, Rosalind had been living with the gradual progression of her Parkinson's disease. Initial diagnosis being in 1983, she told she had 10 years before symptoms increased markedly and there was no doubt it was getting harder. Her movement was compromised and to control it, medication was increasing, bringing with it side effects that had to be coped with. Up until the 1990s, when Rosalind was in her 40s, her Parkinson's disease could be seen as a major aggravation to be coped with, the progression to be feared. As her work, as well as life partner, I could see this firsthand. She found the concentration and coordination of painting harder. The physical exertion of cutting glass and leading became more exacting. It sometimes seemed as though the more the Parkinson slowed her, the more she expressed her stubbornness by making the work ever more complicated and wild. <laughs> All this sense of, if you're going to trip me up, Parkinson's, I'll show you. And it would be fair to describe Rosalind not as working despite her Parkinson's, but the Parkinson's provoking her creativity and making her even more determined. And a good example of this is exemplified by a panel commissioned by a French lawyer wow. who wanted a large piece for his house in Paris the subject of Midsummer Night's Dream. This is Rosalind allowed free reign to weave her own glass fantasy in form and content, and she did. It's a large panel and perspective is irrelevant to the elements of the story. The mechanicals, Oberon and Titania, the whole play is compressed into a five foot complex color riot. She compresses the four storylines into an exuberant and fantastic carpet of colour. It is fair to describe it as an embrasse de richesse. And Rosalind told me that she wanted to create windows you could spend as much time looking at as it took for, you, for her to make. And this is a perfect example of it. Rosalind set to work as though the brief was to make the most complicated panels she could and she was commissioned to make the most common, and she did. I became the beneficiary of this cast of mind, as Rosalind put in a border of hundreds of pieces of mosaic, chandelier tears as swords for fairies. There are Christmas decorations, and even her aunt's chunky necklace as the queen of the fairies' headband. And then she asked me to let it up. <laughs> Incidentally, her use of objects in windows had a precedence. In his enthusiasm for particular colours and textures, Louis Comfort Tiffany had done the same thing, though he was wealthy enough to get his glass made to his own specifications. A fact that I think provoked a sting of envy in Rosalind. The obsession with colour and texture that drove Ros is best seen in the whole process from design to completion of the Chester Cathedral creation window. She set about designing the window with Henri Matisse's paper cutouts in mind. Rather than applying pigment or paint, she was cutting into color in a mimesis, a mimesis to working with glass, 
You could not feel closer to colour without yourself becoming colour. Taking this journey into colour even further, she decided to decide to dye the coloured paper herself. As she drew up the design, the need to address her Parkinson's disease was raised. She went into hospital for a month to have her treatment adjusted with this in mind. With her medical consultant and his team at Western General Hospital, she took on a completely new treatment regime, which involved drawing up medication, injecting herself and setting up a pump with a syringe driver. Now, while this was set up, she took over their re rehabilitation room and turned it into a studio where she continued to work on the designs. And back home, we built a drawing board 14 foot high so the coloured designs could be to size. No scale drawing here, as in effect, a coloured version of all 225 square feet of the window took shape. The first phase of Ros creating the creation was complete. Now all she had to do was turn it into pieces of glass outlined and held by lead. The story of its making was compelling enough for the story of its genesis in May 2000 to completion and dedication in July 2002 to be told in a book titled Six Days, the story of the making of Chester Cathedral Creation Window by Paynton Cowan. Now, sadly, uh, this book is now out of print, but the story it tells in analysis of the window is interesting enough for it to be retold. And it is with a view to this that I'm in contact with the author and the publisher, and I aim to republish it. Now, apart from the artist capturing a vision of the creation, there were provocations in the subject matter. Her friend, the writer Hugh Brody, was working on a book which had led him to a new translation of Genesis by the Hebrew scholar Robert Alter. And this became Rosalind's core text for telling the creation. Rosalind was in very interesting territory here, with her Jewish roots in a dialogue with Christian theology and building. The first book of the Torah and the Old Testament in a dialogue. Now, in this commission, are contained all the features it takes to make a complete portrait of the artist. It is on the more autobiographical life and personality aspects. I want to wrap up this introduction to the work of Rosalind Grimshaw. Her childhood and upbringing with a father who'd fled Germany in the early 1930s because he could see the way things were going, with a mother whose family in 1930s London East End witnessed the black shirt marches of Mosley. And there's an even apocryphal story of Auntie Rose with a revolver in her drawers, with a beloved brother Henry, who was a fellow traveller though his maleness made for a more intense experience with shul and bar mitzvah that took him away from religion into socialist politics. Whilst mother and father weren't devout or strictly observant, they, but they did celebrate Passover and they marked major festivals like Yom Kippur. There was an awareness of her Jewish roots that beat like a pulse in her, which made her what I call culturally kosher, with the understanding that often the only word to describe or a person or a situation was Yiddish. It is important for me to talk about the role of education in Rosalind's life. This went back to her own schooling at Camden School for Girls, where the excellence and ambition of education was coupled with feminism that were driving principles throughout her whole life. It informed her own belief in teaching and education that threaded throughout her life from teaching art at an East End school to Makerere University in Uganda, to the stained glass course at Swansea College of Art, to the summer art school at Hartwell's Primary in Bristol. This latter typified what was Ros's show rather than tell attitude to pedagogy. She provided the materials and tools and set to work herself with an optimistic assumption that they, the students, would just get on with it and her, and they did. And an enduring image I have of the Rosalind School of Children's Education would be the summer holiday art school for children she set up and ran in Bristol. 
She bought something from Oxfam and the plastic bag it came in had a fabric pattern for a pair of shorts. Summer school was sorted, recycled fabric, paints and dyes to make up the patterns and then made on her Bernina sewing machine. The summer of funky shorts, I think of it as. And then the next, an electric, the next summer, an electricity board's telegraph pole was turned into a totem pole. Now, apart from a year in Africa, Roz lived in, and here I'm able to use the word in its true, not overused sense, two iconic places in her life. Her childhood was spent in London's landmark modernist building, Berthold Lubeckin's High Point. A childhood surrounded by an ambience and cast of cosmopolitan and sophisticated characters, many of them German emigres, made it so no surprise that she grew up to be an intellectual and artistic young woman. In 1972, Rosalind Newberger married John Grimshaw in Africa. The couple came back to Bristol where they bought with others a Georgian building of palatial proportions. Here, Rosalind had her first child, Joseph, who died weeks after his birth. This shadow that was cast over her life was brightened by, brightened by the birth of Jem, her eldest boy, and the twins, Esther and Francis. Um, note the wry humour of her panel, her early panel, Esther and Francis watching telly, which depicts the twins asleep on a sofa watching the telly. Now, Rosalind took Grimshaw as her working name as a reaction against the difficulty she had throughout her childhood, of the difference she felt in her name. It was hard to spell and it stood out and it was just difficult. And she felt able to disappear behind the name Grimshaw. However, Six Windsor Terrace became synonymous with Rosalind, with Rosalind Grimshaw, where she lived until her death in 2020. For 48 years, this house was the center of a parade of family, carers, friends, and neighbors. From 1996, it also became her workshop and studio. This was as far from High Point as you could get. She bought an architectural book about High Point, and to emphasize the clean cut forms of the building, none of the photos had people in them. In a move that perfectly summed up Rosalind's personality, she edited her copy of this High Point book with photos from her childhood to humanize it. But back to Windsor Terrace, Six Windsor Terrace, a building as big as her home. It should have been difficult to furnish, but not a bit of it. In this emporium of everything, Ros crammed art, fashion, Objects, glassware, mirrors, puppets, bird cages, massive furniture fit for a London club or hotel, books, even a broken balalaika at one stage, a 14 foot high charcoal cartoon for a stained glass window. It's always going to be difficult in writing about Rosalind for her struggle with Parkinson's disease not to dominate. I know she felt this about the Chester Cathedral Commission and the book about it. In response to that, I repeat my belief that it was her creative determination that made her so remarkable. Certainly, she is the most burning and irrepressibly creative person I have ever met in my life. In conclusion, I'm introducing you to an artist who created at least a thousand works from trinket size to massive walls of glass, from freestanding panels to front doors and fan lights, from international exhibition pieces to works for friends and family, from private to public commissions, from secular to sacred. This is a massive body of work. And a woman, a woman who wore the words, you can't do it and no, lightly. The fullness with which she lived her life is seen in the body of work she left. I am proud to show my love and admiration to praise an exceptional artist and woman who deserved to be far more appreciated and better known than she was. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Patrick. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, Angela, over to you. Angela, are you, do you need to unmute yourself by any chance? Hi, yeah, yeah, thank you everyone for coming and thank you, Patrick, for a terrific talk. And yeah, I mean, yeah, um, Roz, nothing was impossible and she didn't understand the word no. And I think you had the most extraordinary relationship, you know, living and working together. I think you made magic together. Um, well, Rod and I always said we were sisters, soulmates, nearly twins, born a month apart, similar family immigration backgrounds, finding our ways into marriage, being artists, all of that. How did this talk come about? That Jess and I were watching a program about Jewish internment in the UK at the time of World War II. It was given by Monica. It was very soon after Rosie died. And while we were watching this program, I remembered that Rosie's father, a dentist, had been arrested and interned. The program was about Jewish artists interned and how they had, against all odds, drawn and painted with found materials, cleverly concealed and smuggled into the grim camps. One could say that Ros was interned in a recalcitrant body, which for the last 20 years she battled alongside and against. Her physical movements, speech and confidence were all challenged as she continued to work as an artist in her daily practice of drawing, painting, making things and planning the construction of world-class commissions. Not free to roam in a physical sense, even leave her house in the latter years, Nevertheless, she was able to roam her imagination, go into the dark corners of her thoughts, but never be disillusioned with life. In this month's edition of Vogue magazine, the message is find your joy, color texture print with wild colorful pictures of accessories and rioting fabrics worn together. What's new? Roz was always dressing in style with a riot of color striped socks, green plastic crocs. As her friends and family know, she was a passionate fan of fashion and Vogue. Mm. Rosie's visits to us were like royal visits, making way for her, moving furniture, getting the right chair. My grandchildren loved her. She always made an entrance in a fantastical outfit, arms filled with flowers from her garden, ribbons, cakes, and fruit, an unbelievable cornucopia of gifts and love. I think it happens to most people who are bereft that we feel we should have done more, listened more, helped more. I feel that deeply. In later years, as Rosie's motor skills diminished, she needed 24 hour care. But the amazing truth is that her intellectual skills never diminished. She did sometimes have hallucinations and panic attacks and was quite fearful, mainly due to her drugs and the event of Mr. Parkinson, as I called him. Always the three of us in a conversation, making it difficult for us to talk, eat, move, all the things that I take for granted. Our paths crossed when Auntie went in search of a boiling chicken. Auntie, Rose Lament, came from London, as we all did was Rosie's mother's sister. No children of her own and devoted to Rosie and her children. I love that image, Patrick, of um, auntie with her gun down her drawers. She was searching for a boiling chicken to make soup. It had to be a kosher chicken to make authentic chicken soup. And at that time, I was the key holder for kosherina in our synagogue in Park Row. Ros and I chatted on the phone. And as we were so near to each other, I took the chicken to Ros's stained glass studio which was above the Guild craft shop. We'd never met before, but because, and we became instant friends and auntie was happy. We had the Jewish connection, a bit of Yiddish, love of festivals, foods and reading Psalms. And we also had a passion for art. I was a mature art student when we met and while Rosie was making commissioned windows, I was still trying to juggle being full-time student and mom making a Shabbat meal for the family. But one Friday night, I did have time to run out to the opening of Rosie's exhibition in the Bristol Museum. And I saw a little window of a cockerel. 
we have the next one. Um, my hands were probably still covered in chicken soup. And I, but I looked at that and I thought, I've got to have the cockerel, my first stained glass purchase. I showed this framed window to some friends recently, and they thought it was the cockerel in the Chaucer Canterbury Tales, the nun's priest tale, the Chanticleer rooster. I'd never heard of that. Ros would have known all of this, but we never talked about it. As, and I've, as I've learned over the years, Ros's work is steeped in layers of meaning. And you can see the big sun, I think it's sort of sunset. Her early morning was a good time for, to phone Ros from my bed to hers. She started work with the first bird song and her first tablet for Parkinson's, I think about 5 a.m. So if I phoned at eight or nine, she was well underway with the day's drawing. Lots of sunrise paintings, views of the bridges, flyovers over the Avon, below the famous Windsor Terrace, and always self-portraits. In fact, for Rose's 50th, she had 50 portraits of herself on the invitation. Rose was also making things from her bedroom eerie, a magical, inspiring place. Rose made cutouts, cushions, clothes, scarves, leather belts, bags. Well, you know, as, as um, Patrick has told you, and she was listening to BBC World Service. She was always up to date with world news, local gossip, she even joined the Labour Party to get Jeremy Corbyn elected as party leader. So um, in this cut, this is a, a something that Rosie gave me, which I think maybe is part of her African experience. I don't know, but it, and I've had it pinned up, and it's sort of in my house. Um, and then we have the cushion. There's a cushion that she gave me too, which I mean, it's hardly a cushion. It's a painting, really, and it's got you know, this sort of amazing detail of drawing and and then there's kind of like a fish or something in at the bottom and maybe it's got wheels or is it a pram? I'm not sure what it is, some kind of joke in there, I think. And there's lots of uh, buttons and colored bits of um, glass. So just everything was so rich and complex. And the, the next one was, um, This is a window which um, um, was actually made for the Cochrane Theatre for one of their exhibitions. But it came from, because when uh, Sam and Jess were engaged, you know, it met with them just before their wedding in uh, was it, uh, 2007, um, Rosie came to the synagogue and there was a, um, a calling up of the groom before the wedding. And uh, we were all upstairs in the gallery where the women are and um, looking over the balcony. And then down in the, where the red is, you can see sort of people dancing around the bima. And I think also it's, it's a bit of a star of David there in the, in the light bit. And I think it's my four sons. Um, and there's lots of beautiful glass in it. And actually when the light shines, it's a really wonderfully illuminated window. And, but if you, look, if you look on the left, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a cross from maybe a church. But what is totally amazing is that it's called, um, what is it called? You, you are never free, which I think is extraordinary. I, didn't, I, I looked it up in the Cochrane in, um, in the Master Glass catalog and it's called, You are never free. So I think that's really interesting. Um, and then we have um, the next window, which is was a, was a present for Sam and Jess three years ago for their anniversary. And it's the wonderful psalm about the brothers being, um, I've got the psalm here. It's a song of ascent. How good and how pleasant is that brother, is that brothers dwell together. It's like fine oil on the head running down onto the beard, the beard of Aaron that comes down over the collar of his robe. Like the dew of Hermon, Mount Hermon, the fo that falls upon the mountains of Zion. There the Lord ordained blessing, everlasting life. And you can see, I suppose in her translation, it says even life forevermore, everlasting. But you can see the water. I mean, it's just a beautiful psalm. And I think at the top, there's a, there's a drawing of Aaron and you can see it's sort of oil coming down from his head, sort of like wonderful flowing of water and oil. 
And what I like about the idea of water and oil is they don't really mix, but I think, you know, you can, you mix them in a, things can come together, even though they're different. I like that. I think it's just a beautiful, um, we had many adventures. Um, one was to Mallorca and we stayed in my father's old flat. Ros had two carers who were sisters and me, and I slept on the balcony. We tried to buy, is that my noise? Oh. We tried to buy an old glass factory outside Parma. Rosie had spotted in some guide, but we had no time to clinch the deal. She bought two hand-blown rose-colored glass goblets and I bought a bottle for olive oil. We visited the cathedral in Parma and watched the sunset through the beautiful rose window. Rosie always led the way. Coming back was quite tricky, but um, we got back and then we swam and chatted in the Bristol Lido. It was so good for Rosie to swim and float and be free of her body restrictions. Rosie said the pool was for pleasure, not for doing lengths. And we would take up the center space chatting and ignore those speedy macho swimmers. Sometimes conversations were tricky and I would say, where are we, Roz? Have we changed subject? Are you teasing me? I'm a bit deaf and Roz had difficulty speaking when she was immobile with Parkinson's, but we did communicate. But I suppose subtle conversations were difficult and we didn't really discuss our, our artwork over recent years. Sometimes I was commissioned in the house to find a particular vase for flowers. And I had to cut the stems of each flower, put them carefully in the vase under Rosie's instruction. It was so hard to witness a dear friend struggle with basic movements of living. We all know her, but yeah, Rosie would never compromise her conversation or her jokes. It was always keep up or stay in the dark. We all knew her irrepressible spirit, desire for excellence and sense of humor. During the summer after the lockdown, we had coffee and cake in the Magnolia Cafe in the back garden. This was created by Rosie and her and the housemates. Rosie was making a drawing of the tree and we spent one morning sticking it around her new bedroom on the ground floor so that she could work on it from her wheelchair. We had some hair raising travels down to the end of the garden when her carer had to kind of bring us back, but we had fun. A few months before Rosie died, she had a small kiln delivered to fire fused glass. She was getting the hang of working the kiln and had just started making new things. Every moment required a huge effort. Recently, yeah, this is um, a handmade um, silk painting, which I've got sort of behind me, um, that she made for me um, with this wonderful angel. And I think it's for when, when, um, when David died, because if you look on the right hand side, I think we've got some details of that. You can see somebody on a bicycle, it looks like an angel on a bicycle. And then my, and then the children, my children, I think, or lots of children. So I think it was a kind of a bit of a memorial. In fact, we both lost our superheroes, David, my husband, and Rosie, her adored brother, Henry, and both had sudden heart attacks and died a couple of years apart, much the same age. Henry is in one of Rosie's windows, and I have a small glass fragment, which I'm sure is David, complete with bow tie. But Rosie used everyone around her as subjects for her paintings and windows. Every child of hers, grandchild, family member and friend have been drawn over the years. We have aged on paper and in real life. Rosie has always given me a pointed chin. That's the next one. And continually useful, youthful. So, I mean, this is um, hand, you know, it's painted and drawn into, and then for the eyes, the two beautiful beads. I mean, I lost one bead. I think I was wearing it for an exhibition and I lost a bead. Um, but, you know, such a beautiful object to have. So we went to each other's exhibitions and I was at Chester, of course, at the cathedral, which was an amazing event. And Rosie came to mine too. In fact, Patrick reminded me that he drove up my paintings in a hired van to London for the Rubies and Rebels exhibition at the Barbican. I didn't remember that, Patrick, <laughs> which Monica, Monica curated, such a small world. I was painting abstract portraits of the matriarchs and writing Hebrew letters in my work. 
We were both steeped in the Old Testament Bible stories. Ros would read the St. James's Bible, and I was looking at the Jerusalem. Rosie wanted to make a window in our Victorian synagogue in Park Grove in David's memory. His name was Joseph David, but also the window was to be in memory of her lost baby son, Joseph. It was to be a window for both of them. Unfortunately, without David's energy, I, I couldn't um, get, move the project forward, but I still have the drawing for the window, life size, and maybe one day the window can be made or I can show the drawing. So my most recent um, visits to Windsor Terrace have become treasured memories for the meal. Um, Rosie and I decided to celebrate the, um, the Jewish New Year and Yom Kippur, the fast. And you can see Rosie's kitchen and have paintings everywhere. I arrived at the eve of the fast, the candles were lit, the table laid and Brooks haunting Kol Nidre playing on a mobile phone. I was completely bowled over by the beauty of the table. It was a magical evening and Pam, who lives in the house, served the soup followed by rice and chicken, not salty, so that we wouldn't be thirsty during the fast. Rosie had thought of everything. She cut the apples and we dipped them in the honey and you can see Rosie cutting, cutting up the apples. It was, a, it was a really beautiful time. And that was the last time I saw Rosie before her stroke. And the final thing I wanted to show you was, was the, her, last, her last painting that she was making what, you know, before she, up until the stroke. And it's, um, it's uh, she, was, she, was pretty con she was confined to her wheelchair and wasn't able to do more than stand with help. And she turned her kitchen into a studio. In fact, every room that Rosa lived in was a studio. Her painting is pinned on the wall in her kitchen on top of other drawings with a copy of Las Meninas, which is the ladies in waiting by um, Velasquez, folded over her piece. I suspect this piece of canvas has other works underneath. And Velasquez painted this in 1656, his last painting, and he was the leading artist in the Spanish Golden Age. This painting is considered complex and enigmatic, especially the composition. It raises questions about reality and illusion and creates an uncertain relationship between the viewer and the figures shown. I'm sure the family are all in the painting. I'm sure that, I mean, this is a detail, but you can see how the painting is placed on a wall. It's actually between the red chair and the telly. So, Rosie could watch Neighbours if she was Neighbours, she liked, I think Neighbours. But she would have noticed the glances from people and um, we can see in the Velasquez, the artist mixing the paint and about to paint what is, actually, what is actually painted in the work. This is the kind of conundrum Rosie would have loved. And one of the most wonderful things is that, there's, is there another picture of this? Uh, Jess, did I give you two? Oh, that one, yeah. Because um, in fact, this you, you can you can see on the you can see the canvas on the left, and then you can see um, Velasquez, and then next to Velasquez is is um, is is Rosie. I think she's put herself in the painting, and next next then there's a sort of mirror, and actually this. This work is positioned in her kitchen in the same way that I think Velasquez it was positioned in his studio with the light with the windows on the right and she's echoed the sort of hubbub that would have, I mean he's echoed Velasquez you know this is the hubbub of the of the world Rosie lived in her life was her you know her art so she was always the artist her life and work were bound up together. One couldn't survive without the other. And Ros was focused, paid attention to every small detail. The painting, like Velasquez, has the same feeling of hubbub that would have happened on a daily basis in Ros's kitchen, the central room in the house. This painting isn't nearly finished, but in a true Ros style, it's worked into and into again and collaged until her own final painting would have appeared. Mirrors and glass and color in every form were everything to Ros. Sunlight, reflection, illusion, reality. It was her imagination that gave her the opportunity to leave the restrictions of her body and create whatever she wanted. Unable to physically roam the world, 
which she was aching to do. She roamed her mind, never stopped being creative, funny, generous, terrifying, a giant spirit. And I think if there's chicken soup in the afterlife, we'll be eating it together. That's, that's, thank you. That's very nice. Um, thank you so very much, um, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Also wonderful, absolutely. Um, fine, so let me just switch my camera on, I guess. Hold on. Um, no, there we go. Um, Shall we ask Louisa to read her poem? Louisa, I'm sorry, we haven't met and I'm not sure what you look like, but would, would you like to do that? Hiya, yeah, I'm Rosie. Hi, welcome. Hi, thanks, yeah. Hi, um, So I wasn't going to say much, just um, that, so Rosie asked me, you know, she was writing this book and she um, asked me to write something to go in the book. Um, and I was taking a, so I was saying, oh, Sorry, I'll keep, and she's saying, oh, you better hurry up because, um, you know, it's going to be published soon. So this is a poem I wrote for Rosie. And I sent it to her and then um, I didn't, <coughs> I didn't hear it from her, so I don't know if she even liked it or not really. But anyway, this is a poem about Rosie. Louisa, before you carry on, sorry to interrupt, but can everybody make sure they're muted? Because there's some rather strange, <laughs> distracting noises going on in the background. And I'd be grateful if you could just make sure you are muted. Thanks. I can see that there are a few people who aren't. Sorry. That's all right. No worries. Okay, so this is called Rosie. More powerful than Cleopatra, more present than the Mona Lisa, more knowledge than Wikipedia, more swing than Duke Ellington's orchestra, better read than Michelle de Montaigne, better fed than Auguste Escoffier, better gags than Groucho Marx, more electric than Collide and Quarks. More incisive than a surgeon's scalpel, more original than Picasso's pencil, more dialectics than Marx and Hegel, more nourishing than a Brick Lane bagel. <laughs> Better dressed than Lauren Bacall, brighter colours than the saint -Ch -Ch more courageous than Muhammad Ali, floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee. How lovely. <laughs> Lovely. Now, there have been all sorts of wonderfully appreciative comments, and I think all of you will have seen them because they were addressed to everyone. Does anybody have any particular questions or, or yes, questions or comments they'd like to make about, about Ros and her, her work? There must, there must be some, I'm sure. I mean, I certainly found, you know, I mean, her work is a revelation of the rich potential of stained glass. I mean, who would have thought that it could be so versatile and so unorthodox and work so tremendously well? Um, shall I, can I just start perhaps the ball rolling by asking a question perhaps to both of you? But, you know, one thing that I've actually been intrigued by for a long time is the way that Jewish artists or artists from Jewish background, not necessarily observant Jews themselves, have been drawn to Christian faith, Christian iconography. And here we have a case of somebody from an emphatically Jewish background working quite directly in some cases for the Christian church. And I wonder if Ros talked about that at all and whether it troubled her at all or you know what she might have said about it. Yeah, it certainly didn't trouble her. No. But I would say, I mean, that was what I was trying to, to say to some degree in my talk. There's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting frisson, a kind of paradox, mm. um, because with stained glass, it, 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 the tendency is you think church, you think sacred, you think, you think Christian. And that's why, say, for example, Chagall is so fascinating, you know, because it's 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 coming at it, it's coming at something which is seen as very dominantly Christian. You know, and that is that is the tradition of it, but it's not true, you know, it's not the only truth. And that is being subverted in a way um, by artists, you know, as time goes on. It's interesting, apropos that, I mean, I've written quite extensively on Chagall and you know, I, I, that's certainly an aspect of him that I'm very much interested in. Apparently when he was first given a chance to work for, you know, one of the great cathedrals, Christian cathedrals in Europe, and of course he then went on to work for many, he actually wrote to the chief rabbi of Israel to ask if it was okay for him as a Jew, not a practicing Jew, but nevertheless profoundly Jewish in his loyalties and roots, you know, to, to work for the church. And the rather broad-minded rabbi said, yes, go ahead if it feels right to you. And he proceeded to do so. So in other words, it's not quite that straightforward, perhaps not in the case of Ros, but certainly for Chagall. Didn't he do work in Jerusalem, though? 
just the one, only the one synagogue in his whole, you know, 97, I mean, you know, lived, worked, lived for seven, 97 years, and it's just the one synagogue he, he was allowed, mm. you know, to work for, which is one of the, again, the ironies of, of his, his career. Um, any, any questions at all? I think there was one I, I just spotted um, asking about her main influences. Could you perhaps say a little bit? I think you mentioned Matisse, clearly the cutouts, but... And Chagall, she loves Chagall. And Chagall as well, yeah, yeah. Anybody else sort of comes to mind? I mean, lots of influences. Not really. She's a great lover of Picasso. She's a great lover of... She, I mean, as, as you know, as you see, Matisse is um, obviously... And um, oh, her, her, her stained glass two tops were um, uh, Harry Clark, we were both Irish. They're what they called the Antura Gloin, the, the Celtic, it's, it's the, the, the glass tower. And that is Harry Clark and Wilhelmina Geddes. The other thing about Rosalind to bear in mind, and this is something that's very special to arts and crafts stained glass. Arts and crafts stained glass was very, very, very feminist in the sense that there were a lot of fantastic women artists that didn't seem to be the prejudice that, that you know, well, is still extant, um, you know, but, but for some reason, the arts and crafts movement was very, very liberal, and very liberated, and a lot of fantastic, Wilhelmina Geddes it was Ros's very favorite artist wonderful lady yeah and yet they're not well-known names are they they obviously deserve to be better known interesting sorry oh well the, 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 yeah um so i met, might have missed the beginning about why she chose to do stained glass uh, why wasn't she why didn't she just become a painter she she did well if you really want to know she met someone at a party <laughs> she met the man who ran who ran the workshop. I mean, she was she was painting and printmaking, and uh, designing fashion, printing fabric, and she met someone, the man who ran the studio, and he said, "If you," and she just showed an interest, and he said, "If you turn up, if you want to, I will rent you a corner of the studio, and we'll show you." Um, him and the, 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 the one craftsman who was there, we will show you how to do stained glass. And she just took to it like a duck to water. Amazing, because her, her work is very free in a way. And um, uh, it, I would have thought the stained glass would be quite sort of cumbersome and difficult to work with. That's what's so exciting about it, because she actually takes a very rigid medium and frees it up in many ways yeah. and and um well it, it's all paradoxical i mean she painted it and she was very disciplined with how much paint and stippling and but 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 then came out with a freed a, a freed object at the end i something you could say she was a little bit like michelangelo freeing the slave in the stone she was a bit like that with colored glass it was like freeing you know the slave in the, if you like, you know. Maybe. So, so she didn't do a, a church or anything in Bristol? Not in Bristol. She, did, she didn't do very many churches. Uh, church, she did one in Staffordshire. She did three in Sussex. And Whereabouts? Yes, where West, in West Sussex, Balcombe, you know where that place where well, the... I, I used to live in East Sussex, so anything in East Sussex I might know. Oh right, Balcombe and another place called Skeynes Hill, she did two lovely, well, very famous. Skeynes Hill. Mm. Oh, yeah, well, Skeynes Hill. Very close well, to Ditchling, yeah. Ditchling and Eric Gill land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you tell us more, Patrick, about how the Chester Commission came to happen because that's a major you know that was obviously a major major you know prestigious undertaking and extraordinary result well initially it was um initially uh, her name came up because uh, the, there was um very famous well well-known stained glass artist called alan younger who normally did work for the Duke of Westminster, who was very instrumental behind Chester Cathedral. And he was too busy with work. 
that he they wanted a create uh, they want not a creation window they wanted a millennium window he was too busy so they said we'll have a competition and they had a very limited competition and actually coincident well bit of nepotism we did know the architect and he put he he thought Ros would do a fantastic piece of work and there was a list a short list of it was only three artists but she did her design we went and presented it and they kind of they kind of dissolved the competition immediately mm. they were so excited mm. And lovely uh, comment, Patrick, that just came in. It's very simple. Said, "Wow!" And I can imagine that was probably yeah. their response when they when they saw the uh, the. Oh no, well, it was a very strange because Rosalind had a very bad episode of of she could be very rivy and very uh, with her Parkinson's, and we did the presentation and she had a really hard time, and she felt awful, and we we, we walked out. And we thought, "Oh my God, we've we've blown it." And they said, and and they were they were the opposite. They just said, well, they said well, you see that design and that design, and then we see this design. You can see we didn't really have to make a decision. Mm. So you know, it was it was just breathtaking all the way. Her design was just smashing. <laughs> Well, there have been a whole host of wonderfully appreciative comments, as I already mentioned. What I will do, I can actually um, copy the chat and I'll send it to both of you so you'll see for yourselves how much uh, of a positive response there's been to both your talks. I think it's probably time to find out the supper bacon, I suspect, suspect it does. And um, can I just, well, first of all, say a very heartfelt thank to both of you, to Louisa as well, for a truly memorable uh, and, and warm, fabulous event. Uh, what an inspiration, and I don't use that term very often. Um, can I also just, in a more sort of factual way just alert people to another event if you've got the time and energy at eight o'clock tonight which actually relates in quite interesting ways to um this one which is why i put the two together it's about um, a hungarian or an artist of Hungarian Jewish origin called George Meyer Martin, who came as a refugee from Nazi Europe to this country and became quite an influential um, muralist and indeed mosaic um, artist taught at Liverpool School of Art and worked quite extensively for the Catholic Church. So there's going to be what promises to be a very interesting talk about him at eight o'clock tonight. Uh, there are other events happening this week on different subjects, not so directly relevant. So if you are at all interested, do check out the Insiders Outsiders Festival.org website and look at the what's on section. And I'd like to finally mention that um, there's also a conference, and I've mentioned it to, to Patrick and Angela, on the 16th of June, it will be happening partly live, partly online, we'll have to play that one slightly by ear, but it's looking precisely at this broader phenomenon of artists of Jewish, ref mostly refugee origin, who ended up using Christian iconography and or working for the Christian church. And that will be a very, very interesting, quite intensive event, and again, uh, details of that are on the Insiders Outsiders website. And last but last, least, I should uh, just uh, alert you to the fact that this has been recorded and we will be uploading the recording onto the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel within the next week or so. So if you'd like to watch it again or tell your friends about it, um, please, please feel free to do so. So I think that's probably enough for one wonderful session. Thank you very much again, everyone, for being here, for your appreciative comments, and once more to Patrick and to Angela in particular. Wish you well, everyone, and good night. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye.